tonight we have right, right from Washington, D.C., a, a book that's making a lot of waves and news and getting a lot of people excited and talking is Richard Reeves. He's a senior fellow in economic studies where he holds John C. and Nancy D. Whitehead chair. Rich, chair. Richard is a director of the Future of the Middle, e Middle Class Initiative. Excuse the. <laughs> His research focuses on the middle class, inequality, and social mobility. Richard's publications for Brookings include his latest book of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Man is Struggling, Why It Matters, and What to Do About It, and Dream Hoarders, How the American Upper Middle Class is Leaving Everyone Else in the Dust, Why That is a Problem, and What to Do About It. He is a contributor to The Atlantic, National Affairs, Democracy Journal, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Times. Richard is also the author of John Stuart Mill, Victorian Firebrand, uh, it was published in 2008, an intellectual biography of the British liberal philosopher and politician. Richard sits on the board of, of Jobs for the Future. He's an advisor to the American Family Survey and to the Equity Center of the University of Virginia. He has previously served as a consultant to the Opportunity Insight team led by, the, by Professor Raj Chetty at Harvard University and as a member of the Government of Canada's Ministerial Advisory Committee on Poverty. Richard's previous roles include director of DEMOS, the London-based, or DEMOS, uh, DEMOS, I think, the London-based political think tank, director of Futures at the Work Foundation, prin principal policy advisor to the Minister for Welfare Reform, social affairs editor of The Observer, research fellow at the Institute for Public Policy Research, economics correspondence for The Guardian, and a researcher at the Institute of Psychiatry University of London. He's also a former European Business Speaker of the Year. Richard has a BA from Oxford University and a PhD from Warwick University. So uh, without further ado, please help me welcome Richard Reeves to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That resume makes me feel really old. <laughs> that can't be right. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a really great honor to be part of this series. As I look down the list of other people that you've had speak and you have coming to speak, I really did feel like I was very privileged to be joining, joining that roster. So thank you. And thank you to all of you. I know that time is precious, so giving up your time uh, for this subject means uh, a lot to me. Um, even for those of you who are here because your professor has forced you to be here for credit, <laughs> which is that row there. Um, <laughs> but thank you anyway, even though I know you didn't have any choice. Um, so, uh, I've written a lot about family, gender, class, racial equity, both in the UK, where I'm from, as you can probably tell. If you hadn't got it from my resume, you can get it from the way I sound. Um, and it led me to this, this strange subject. I've never had this title for the lecture before. That's Anwar's doing, which is the peculiar condition of the human male, obviously related to the humanities aspect here. But it's, um, it's a quote that obviously that echoes Simone de Beauvoir, uh, who said in 1949, nobody would ever, ever have the thought of writing a book on the peculiar condition of the human male. Always we're writing about the peculiar condition of the human female. But she made the point that that would never be a subject for conversation because the default was always about, everything's about men. The world is run by men, for men, and along male lines. But, well, here we are. And I've just written a book about the peculiar condition of the human male for reasons that we can get into. Um, but I'm not the first to do it, of course, and so I think it's very important to acknowledge some of, the, uh, some of the predecessors. So this is Hannah Rosen's book, The End of Men, based on an Atlantic essay of the, of the same title, uh, which was in 2012. Uh, this is uh, Kay Heimwitz's book, Manning Up. This is Zimbardo and Cullum's book, Man Interrupted. Andrew Yarra wrote a book for the same press as me, the Brookings Institution Press, called Man Out, Men on the Sidelines of American Life. You know, it was about four or five years ago. And Warren Farrell and John Gray have a book, The Boy Crisis, et cetera. So it's not that there aren't any books out there, um, and especially I would say in the last decade or so, there's been a really growing interest in what is going on with boys and men. So why this? Why, why another book on boys and men? You have to justify it, not least... You know, because you're going to spend all this time writing it, you've got to sort of think, well, what am I going to add? What value can I add to this already crowded debate? And I'm going to say in a moment why, but I also want to be honest about the fact that it's at least partly autobiographical. I am a father of three boys. Um, they are now all in their 20s, so I use this picture because this is the last time I was taller than all of them. 
I'm now shorter than all of them. Um, so this is d a dated picture, but I've raised the three of them both on, on the U in the UK and the US, including some time as the some years as the primary stay-at-home parent uh, to my boys. And so I've seen through their eyes a little bit some of the challenges to uh, the, the boys and men face in these two different societies. But to be clear, the boys and men that I'm most concerned about in the book and in general are not those who have all the advantages that my sons have. I'm particularly interested in those who have less economic power. They have less social status in society. And I'm surprised myself by the fact that I'm writing about this subject. I consider myself to be a strong gender egalitarian. I've done a lot of work um, uh, towards gender equality in the way that I think it would normally be defined. And I see that there are many, many areas where we have much more to do on behalf of women and girls, obviously around the world, but including in advanced economies like the United States. Um, I won't list all of them here, but many of you will be familiar with some of the issues that there remain around things like gendered pay gaps, distributions of labor, uh, the kind of emotional labor that goes into just being a woman in public spaces, et cetera. And I happen to be married to a woman who is trying to raise money for a startup a business. And so I happen to know that only 3% of venture capital money goes to female founders. I'm reminded of that on, I think, a nightly basis. <laughs> at least when I'm at home. Of course, I'm not at home 50% of the time, but that's not why I'm not at home. I'm <laughs> promoting a book. Um, <laughs> so there are many issues where um, women and girls are still on the wrong side of those inequalities, and most of those are concentrated towards the top of society. I think we still see, for example, very significant gender gaps in political representation, especially in places like the US, in boardrooms. It's not to say there hasn't been huge progress on those fronts. There has been enormous progress in recent decades. But still, the lack of representation at the kind of the apex of society um, runs the traditional way. And so if we spend most of our time in upper middle class or upper class circles or worried about the apex, then Maybe you don't see some of the problems that I see when I look at the data, which I'm about to share with you, which is predominantly the problems that are faced by men with much less economic power, working class men, poorer men, and especially black boys and men in our society, where the intersection of race and gender plays against them in ways that I will describe. And so I just want to make the point right from the outset that it's very important to look at this question through lenses of race and class related to my previous work as well as gender. We have to be quite careful to be looking further at society than just around us. We might be, to borrow Sheryl Sandberg's phrase, we might be leaning in, but not looking down. And the class gaps that have opened up in our society, which is the focus of my previous book, are very significant. Uh, and so we have to look at gender through that. And so it's partly, autobi it's partly autobiographical. But I also felt that the debate about sex and gender, and I'll use those two terms for now, wasn't a very productive one in the US. I felt that it had increasingly been framed as a zero-sum game, uh, and you had to choose sides. And as I assembled the evidence for some really disturbing trends, I thought, facing some boys and men, I was warned by a number of colleagues that this was not an issue to go into. That this was a, ri a risky question to put on the table. And that merely having a, a book on boys and men um, a book with this title would inevitably provoke uh, an, a reaction that I not only understand but feel, which is, really? Or as a podcast host said to me when I was on recently, he's like, how dare you? Um, or uh, somebody else, why, opening question, why do you hate women so much? And so, like, you know that this is obviously going to be a controversial subject, but the more that I was warned away from the subject, the more I felt it was important to step into it. Because something of a vicious cycle then gets created. If the only people who are willing to engage with what I see as the real issues facing many of our boys and men are those who are from a particular ideological slant, and everybody else is obliged not to talk about it because that would mean abandoning their other commitments, say, to women and girls, they're in real trouble. Then we've just ceded the ground to irresponsible people. And here I'm not making a point about left or right. I mean left or right. It is an axiom of political and cultural life that if responsible people don't address real problems, irresponsible people will exploit them. And so look, it said to me that looking away was not a responsible option. And instead, we needed a good faith conversation about what's really going on. 
And so that's what I've attempted to do in this book. I also wanted to put some solutions on the table so that rather than just more cultural commentary, that actually we could start to talk about some practical policy solutions. I work at the Brookings Institution. We're a policy think tank. That's kind of what we do. And I wanted to make some of the discussion around this subject a little bit less cultural, a little bit more policy-oriented, a little bit more wonky. Of the many reviews of my book that uh, I've had so far, the one that perhaps pleased me the most was from Matthew Iglesias. Some of you will know him, co-founder of Vox, who wrote a long review of the book, in which he said, Reeves's book is earnest, bordering on banal. <laughs> I was thrilled by that, and I said to my publisher, let's put that on the paperback. <laughs> earnest, bordering on banal. Um, but he meant it in a good way. And what he meant was he tried to actually just, so here are some facts. Here, let's, what do we do about them? So, yes, as a father. What I'm going to do is go through some of the facts. Um, I think we, we talked a little bit about my previous career as a journalist on The Guardian and The Observer. The founder of The Guardian, C.P. Scott, famously said, comment is free, but facts are sacred. And so I just think let's get some facts on the ground and then see what implications they might have for the way we think about this discussion. So let's start with education. Uh, appropriate enough, given that we're in an educational institution. Um, this chart shows you the percentage of degrees. Um, here I'm showing bachelor's degrees and um, postgraduate degrees. Uh, the number of women um, getting a degree for every 100 men, and this goes back to 1971. So the, the beginning of this chart is when Title IX was passed um, to promote the cause of women and girls in education. You can see why there was so much effort paid during the 1970s and 80s to promote the cause of women in, in higher education. You can also see a pretty, pretty rapid catching up. It turned out that actually once we kind of removed some of the obstacles and started to invest properly in women and girls' educational opportunity, they, they caught up, um, overtook, leveled out more recently. But now there's a bigger gender gap in higher education in the US than there was in 1972. It's just the other way around. So in 1972, there's roughly a 13 percentage point gap uh, in favor of men getting a four-year college degree, there's now about a 15 percentage point gap in favor of women getting a four-year college degree. Um, and it's worth saying, I think, that um, this is not necessarily, this, 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 is this good or a bad thing? I'm not making any comment about this at the moment. I'm just stating the facts. We can discuss what this means, um, but I think it's important to start with the facts. And so the fact is that there's been a great reversal um, in higher education um, to such an extent now that, as I said, the gap is bigger today than it was in 72. Um, and you can see it took a bit longer with um, postgraduate degrees, but there was, there was a similar trend there. Now, of course, to some extent, colleges are sort of reflecting what happens earlier. So let's look at high school. Um, so this ranks high school GPA um, from left to right, lowest on the left, highest on the right by decile. So we split up the GPA distribution into deciles, equal size tenths and then just looked at like, what's the gender composition. So what this tells us that of those with the highest GPAs, top 10% GPAs, two thirds are girls, and of those with the lowest, two thirds are boys, and roughly a linear relationship in between. So there's quite a bit of overlap, but a very, very strong skew in terms of GPA. Now, um, I could show other charts which don't show a gender gap. So there isn't really a gender gap on standardized tests, for example, uh, SAT, ACT, et cetera. There isn't, there isn't really a gender gap. Uh, on those, but there's, as you can see, a big one on GPA. This has implications for the previous chart because as colleges become more, more test optional, I have no idea what the policy here is. Are you test optional here? Yeah. Um, one of the a very good study of going test optional uh, is to show that the main effect it has is to skew the, uh, the gender composition of the campus. Um, a decent estimate, this is Chris, um, Chris William. Uh, his name will come to in a moment, um, work shows that the impact of going test optional is to increase the female share by about four percentage points, um, which is much bigger than any effect it has on any other group, by the way. And it's, and it's kind of obvious why that would be so if you look at this chart. Um, there isn't really a gender gap in SAT, but there's a big one in GPA. So if you go test optional, then you're going to skew more female. Again, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. In fact, GPA predicts your success in college much better than standardized tests. So if you're an institution that's concerned about, like, are, we gonna, are, these, are these students going to stay and finish, quite right to kind of put more of a weight on GPA. It's just more of those are obviously going to be girls. And it turns out that even conditional enrollment, um, there is a much higher dropout rate for men. So again, if you're concerned about completion, conditional enrollment, then you should be incentivized to take more women because they are more likely to complete. So there's about a 10 percentage point gap in enrollment 
um, gender gap, but there's also a similar size gap in four-year completion rates between male and, male and female students, so conditional enrollment, about as big a gap in four-year completion rates. Um, so I've already mentioned C.P. Scott, so here's a, here's a picture of him, just the facts are sacred point. Um, now, that's education, but I want to talk a little bit about how some of this then plays out in real life, and one of the most salient facts is probably suicide. Um, and so if we think about, um, so this shows you suicide rates by age, but these different age groups, 15 to 24, 25 to 44, and uh, 45 to 64, the blue dot being 99 and the um, orange arrow being 1,019. You can see it's gone up for all groups, but both uh, male and female. Um, but, there's a very st the, but the, big, the gap has um, grown. There's a bigger gap. It's a roughly a four-fold gap in the risk of suicide. Um, between males and females. And so some, to some extent, I think some of this is playing out. I actually meant to have this earlier in the presentation. I apologize. So I want to get back to this. Okay, so girls ahead in GPA in high school by a long way with all kinds of consequences. Why is that? Well, I'm going to suggest a few reasons. Number one, for all the debate about are there differences between male and female brains, and the answer is not really in a way that matters very much at all once we're grown up, there isn't a debate about the timing of brain development. Girls' brains develop earlier than boys because they hit puberty earlier than boys, on average. Um, and in ways that are important. It's, it's the prefrontal cortex where the big difference is. Um, the prefrontal cortex is the bit of your brain that has you turn in your chemistry homework. Um, because turning in your chemistry homework is a really, really complex task. It requires you to take your chemistry homework home, remember you've got chemistry homework, do your chemistry homework, take your chemistry homework back in, hand it in to the teacher, remember that you have a chemistry class. So it's like, uh, and that last was a particular problem for one of my kids at least. Uh, oh, I have chemistry. Um, and so that's like sometimes called the CEO of the brain. It's like not, it's, it's not about smarts, it's about organizational skills and it just develops earlier in girls. So what this chart shows you is age across the bottom, uh, from 10 through till in the mid-20s, um, girls on the left, boys on the right. And what this shows you, two of the things that actually come out of a develop, a developing prefrontal cortex, which is um, the ability to have impulse control. So the blue line shows you, and it's a standardized scale, um, levels of impulse control by age. So that's what psychologists think of as the break, the thing that stops you doing something or thinks it through, has more future orientation. And the orange line is sensation seeking, which is a bit of your brain that says, go for it. That's a great idea. Um, or as a friend of mine once put it, the most dangerous sentence you can hear out of a young man's mouth is, here, hold, hold my drink and watch this. <laughs> and you can see here that there's um, a, a significant gap um, by time. And so you can see this period of adolescence is the period where, you know, just a little bit low on impulse control, everything's a great idea, um, uh, uh, and a bit high on sensation seeking. Uh, sorry, it's sensation seeking is like everything's a good idea, and impulse control, not so good. So the gas and the brake in the car, if you think about it like that, a bit too much gas, not enough brake, right? Hence all the risk-taking activities of adolescence. You also see a very big difference between boys and girls. Not only in the extent of the gap, but the timing of the gap too, and it turns out that the prefrontal cortex development gap is biggest in adolescence. As Margaret Mead once said, if you walk into a room full of 15-year-old girls and boys, you wouldn't just think they're a different sex, you'd think they're a different species. Anybody that's spent time around them kind of probably knows what I'm talking about, right? Just, it just is a development gap. And again, it's not smarts. Girls are not smarter than boys or vice versa. But girls get their act together a bit earlier than boys. And if you have an education system that rewards how much have you got your act together at the age of 16, 17, it would be shocking not to see a massive gender gap in favor of girls. It's just baked in. We, tie, we, we take that critical period of the educational journey, make it very, very important to what's going to happen to you after that, and then wonder why there's a gender pay gap. But there's something else going on in schools as well, which is um, a bit of a lack of male teachers. I don't have the trend here. This is cross-section. But the trend is that um, the share of um, teachers in K-12 education who are male is now 24%, down from uh, 31% in the 80s, and you can also see where the gaps are biggest uh, through the education system. Um, and so there's been a, grow a growing trend towards the, quotes feminization of the teaching profession, um, especially in high school, actually. Meanwhile, we've actually gotten close to gender parity in post-secondary education, which is great news. 
Uh, and so what we're seeing actually is kind of real asymmetric set of trends in education, which is that the areas that were previously male dominated, like colleges and so on, we've done a, we've done a pretty good job of getting closer. We're not there yet, and only a third of college presidents are women, but give it 10 years. Um, I'm predicting parity. And there's a big campaign to make that happen. Um, but in elementary schools, in middle schools, just actually fewer men than there used to be. And in early years education, almost none. My uh, middle son is actually an early years educator. That makes him one of the between 2 and 3% share of men in early years education. As a share of the profession, there are actually now twice as many women flying US military jets as there are men teaching kindergarten. About 7% of US military pilots are women, which is still only 7%. Um, but only 2 or 3% of our kindergarten teachers are men. But as the women's movement taught us, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And so what message are we sending, for one thing, about the roles of men and women, but also what happens when you have these institutions that are so gender skewed one way or the other? It should be no surprise that it's not to the advantages of the other gender. We've learned, for example, that having a female STEM teacher is really good for girls, particularly in high school. But we also know that having an English, a male English teacher is really good for boys. What is the subject that men in K-12 are least likely to teach? English. So not only are not enough men, but they're also not in the subject where they would have the most effect. And I think back to my, and again, end of one, anecdotally. The fact that my English teacher in my high school was a man at a critical period, I think was non-trivial. I had remedial English for a while. Um, and I think that if you're going to try and get a bunch of 16-year-old working class boys to weep over Andrew Marvell's love poetry, <laughs> it helps to be a Korean War veteran and a guy, uh, which he was, Mr. Wyatt was. So I'm not suggesting for a moment that's always going to be true. But we have learned a little bit about actually seeing yourself in your teacher and in other roles turns out to be quite important on dimensions of race, but also of gender. So I think this is a problem too. The education system is now, I would argue, structured in ways that are more female friendly than male friendly. And we see the result. And I think that's a problem. And I think many of our boys are struggling in their schools and many of them don't feel seen. What about the labor market? Well, this is the other place where there's been a huge change, and mostly just a lot of hugely positive changes in the labor market. Um, and it's important to acknowledge those facts. So this is uh, looking at the, the wage distributions, um, of the, the female and male wage distributions, the kernel density distribution. So the exact numbers on the axes don't really matter. What matters is the shape. And what this tells you is, in 1979, the male and female earnings distributions looked really different. Right. And in 1979, only 13% of women earned more than the median man. So take the guy in the middle of the distribution, how many women were above him? 13%. Right? It was like, you, you could tell, you knew which one was the male and the female distribution, right? Without anybody else telling you. Today, not so much. So today, 40% of women earn more than the median man. That is not 50%, but it's a lot more than 13%. Something else has happened. You can see how the distribution has gotten flattened and pushed out to the right. And so what it's telling me is there's much more earnings inequality than there used to be. So it used to be much more bunched, now they're much more spread out. So what it's telling me is that both men and women at the top are doing much better by comparison to everybody else. So we've seen huge class inequality growing. Even as the gender gap has closed, the class gap has widened quite significantly. Then when we go into households, that's compounded because with something which sociologists call assortative mating. Men and women tend to marry people with similar education and income levels as themselves. Assortative mating is a very unromantic term. I don't suggest anyone uses it on a dating profile or anything. But seeking to assortatively mate is not, you don't want, want to say that, but you, but you probably are. Um, and so actually on a household level, it gets even worse. And this just dramatizes the point, which shows you the wage trends against 79. Why 79? Because that's when we have good data series. And just shows you the wage trends for different groups. And so the hatched, the ones with the cross through, that's women. And it's women at the top, the 80th percentile. So they're a fifth of the way from the top. And then the middle, the median. And then the bottom, 20, and then the bottom, which is a fifth of the way up. All right? So I've, I've measured it a fifth of the way up, a fifth of the way from the top, and then the middle. And then the other lines are the men. It's the cumulative change in wages over that period. So on most measures, it is true to say that most American men earn less today than most American men did in 1979. 
Not all, the ones at the top doing much better. And of course, these are from different bases. So as I'm gonna show you in a minute, that does not mean that women have on average overtaken men. It just means that the growth rates have been dramatically different. And in fact, when you intersect by race, you get in some ways an even more interesting story. So again, what this shows you is that the, the, blue, the blue circle is 1979, the uh, orange on the right-hand side is 20, so it's 2020. So what's happened to median earnings, that's the middle of the distribution of these different groups. I'm showing white men, white women, black men, and black women. Obviously, it's simplified. I could be showing other groups as well. I could show Asian, which would be above. Um, and so what can you see? Well, everyone's wages have gone up a bit, some by more than others. White men, still like out there, something of an outlier. But look at the sort of example, of the story between white women and black men. So white women used to earn quite a lot less than black men, now they earn quite a lot more. So for every dollar earned by a white woman, a black man earns about 84 cents. Um, black woman, about 80 cents. So black men are, black men are still slightly ahead of black women, um, but white women have seen ex really very, very strong earnings growth um, in that period. And by comparison to other groups, and black men, very, very small earnings growth, black women a little bit less. So the point here is simply to say that it's complicated and that we should be very, very careful not to get trapped into what Hans Rosling called this kind of binary thinking. We have to intersect it by race and class as well. Uh, and it's very important, I think, as we look at what's happening to men, that we don't base our assumptions on our necessary our own experience. Now, I've already mentioned the fact that we don't have enough men in teaching. But given that a lot of men are struggling in the labor market, I also want to make the point there aren't enough men in what I call heel jobs. So heel jobs like the opposite of STEM. So you know, most people know what STEM is, science, te technology, engineering, and math. Actually, it was, um, it was called SMET. And then Judith Ramily came in and was into the National Science Foundation, where she was told her job was to promote SMET. She said, I'm not promoting SMET. What's that? And they told her, she said, no, it's terrible. Let's call it STEM. The rest is history. Um, never doubt the power of a good acronym to actually change public policy. But HEAL is Health, Education, Administration, and Literacy. Now, these are just a few different jobs. So at the top, uh, sorry, the yellow one in the middle is elementary and middle school teachers. So that's uh, kind of like the chart I showed you before. I'm showing you social workers, which is the other blue line in the middle, psychologists at the top, and then nurses at the bottom. And this is the share of those occupations that is male since 1980. Now, there's a few things going on here. Number one is like there has been a bit of an increase in the share of nurses and nursing assistants. Where's Jeff? Who's also a nursing assistant. We need more men in these roles. Thank you. A um, bit of an increase in the share of, of, of nurses, but still very low. Um, we can talk about pay maybe in a minute. But a dramatic decline in the other. And I think that's important for a number of reasons. One is because actually just diversity of provision should mean that like if we're worried about, say, the mental health of you know, men and women, we should make sure that we've got diversity of provision. We should make sure that we have men and women in those caring roles to provide for them. I know that when I wanted therapy, the things I was dealing with, I did better with a male therapist, same with one of my sons. But that, that's harder if there aren't as many around, and you can see how that's changed. And in fact, among psychologists under the age of 30, only 5% are men. What's other, also quite interesting about it is they didn't used to be so gender seg segregated. Look at them in 1980. So when people say, oh, yeah, well, those are women's professions. Well, they didn't used to be yesterday. I mean, that's the blink of an eye. So you take those areas like middle, middle elementary school teaching, social work, psychology was slightly more male. Absolutely plummeted, male share. So they've become female professions. Even as we've desegregated other professions, we have deeply segregated some of these professions. And I think that's a problem for all kinds of reasons, not least um, the fact that actually having a diversity of provision is a good idea. Um, I've mentioned the suicide rates earlier. Um, it is the case right now that um, men are about 10 percentage points more less likely to get mental health care than women. Now, that could be because men don't need it as much. Maybe men are 10 percentage points less likely to have mental health problems than women, but that doesn't seem to me to align with the evidence. So what's going on there? There's all kinds of evidence about men finding it harder to get help, blah, blah, blah. But maybe it would help if we had more male psychologists and therapists and substance abuse counselors. Most substance abusers are men, but most substance abuse counselors are women by some massive margins. But you might say, well, maybe men don't want those jobs. Maybe they're not very male jobs. And isn't it true that men and women, despite what I said earlier about not differing very much, do differ a little bit in their preferences? Some of you may be aware of the, the psychological distinction between being into people and being into things. Any psychologists in the room? 
hands up who's a psychologist. Okay, good. So if I get this slightly wrong, it'll, I'll be told afterwards, someone watching the Zoom. People things, I'm into people, into things. So people say, well, women are more into people, men are more into things. You know, she's having coffee and chatting to a friend, he's tinkering in the garage. Whatever, choose your stereotype. It's true, but it's true on average. And the distributions significantly overlap. So it can't explain massive differences in, in occupation. So it cannot explain, for example, why only 2 or 3% of our early years educated are men. That is not explained by any plausible differences in the, aver in, in the averages in the psychological makeup of men and women. And I came across this study by Rong Su and James Rounds, which actually tried to operationalize this insight. So what they did was they looked on, and it was on this kind of people things dimension. So what this shows you, and some of these numbers are a little bit out of date, but it doesn't matter for the purposes of the exercise. What she actually showed was, what's the actual share of women in these different professions? That's the blue bars. And then the orange line says, given everything we know about the personality profiles from this huge survey of the personality profiles of men and women on the people things dimension, what would we predict the share of women would be in those professions? So they took the personality profile and said, on average, women are a bit more into people, men are a bit more into things. So what that would mean is you'd see, you wouldn't see 50-50 in every occupation. So they predict 30% of engineers would be women. 40% of healthcare workers would be men, and about 30% of nurses would be men, compared to what's actually happening. Now, then you see some in the middle where we're doing pretty well. Okay, so the point here is to try and refute two, I think, false views about the differences between men and women which are naturally occurring and what that means for our society. View number one is there are no naturally occurring differences between men and women that affect their psychology or preferences. I don't think that's, I personally don't think that stands scrutiny. That it's all socialization. But the other view is, yes, there are differences between men and women and they're huge and they explain why women shouldn't be engineers. And men can't be nurses. And women can't be presidents or astronauts or whatever it is, whatever it is, right? Which is insane. The key point is that even if there are differences on average between two groups, they massively overlap, usually. And so there's no more grounds to discriminate against my son, who wants to be an early years educator, on the fact that on average fewer men are going to want to be an early years educator than there is to discriminate against my sister-in-law, who's an engineer on the grounds that, on average, more men are going to want to be engineers. We have to get away from the idea that it's one of the two. It's either brains determine jobs or everything socialized. We need a more nuanced view. The last area I looked at was the family. I work in the Center on Children and Family. And here there's been huge change as well, um, some of which I would say have just been disorienting for men because we've changed the model of masculinity as an inevitable and positive result of some of the economic trends that I've identified earlier. So if we look since 1970 at some of the trends here, we'll see this shows you the share of women who earn more than their spouses, where you're both earners. This one shows you who are more educated than their spouses. Not surprising given the trends we saw earlier. This one shows you the share of households where a woman is the primary or sole breadwinner. Some of those are single parents, of course, but not all. And this shows you the uh, share of women in the labor force when they have children under the age of six or, well, yeah, under the age of six. So just think about what the world looked like in the 70s, the world where my mom was raising me, uh, and what it looks like now. This is one of the most important achievements of modern history. As Margaret Mead and Gloria Steinem and many other leaders of the women's movement correctly identified, the key was to reduce the ties of economic dependency. It was about economic independence. And the way that had to happen was for women to enter the labor market, to earn more, et cetera. And again, at the risk of repeating myself, not to say mission accomplished, but my goodness, what an extraordinary achievement towards that goal to make, as Gloria Steinem put it, to make marriage a choice, not a necessity. To make men optional. That's an extraordinary achievement. And it was the central animating goal, I think, of that wave of the women's movement. But as the conservatives at the time said, what about the men? What happens to the men when we make them optional? 
And the, women's, the leaders of the women's movement, quite rightly, in my view, said, I don't know. That's not our problem. <laughs> you know, we're busy reinventing femininity. Thank you. That's for you. I think that was right. But I also think that we didn't really take the task as seriously as we should have done. That just because you have this hugely positive social and economic change doesn't mean it can't have some unsettling second round effects in terms of what does it mean? What's the role today? What does it mean to be a man? And I'll finish, I'll come back to that in a moment. But the last thing I want to talk about the labor market um, is the extent to which um, people talk about the pay gap. Um, this is a bit of a wonky chart for so late, isn't it? I apologize. Mm, okay. I'll just tell you what it says so that you don't have to worry too much about it. And this is actually uh, Danish data, but there's US data to support it. Basically, the story here is what happens to women who have children and don't have children on the left, that's their earnings. The one who don't have children at the top, the ones that do at the bottom. And then men on the right, men who have children and men who don't have children. Having a child for a woman is the economic equivalent of being hit by a meteorite. The gender pay gap is largely a parenting pay gap. It's about the gender distribution of labor around raising children. And what's really nice is that we now have pretty good data from same-sex couples, where you see exactly the same pattern, where the birth mother has a similar impact on her earnings. Her partner, assuming it's a same-sex uh, uh, lesbian couple or, a, or two women in a same-sex relationship, her partner keeps earning. So it's exactly the same. So it's really nice now because you have good social science which can tell us that it's really about our parenting pay gap. That starts to matter a lot more when family life has really changed because increasingly they're not necessarily together. This shows you the share of births that are taking place outside marriage in 1990 and 2016 by the education of the mother. So what you can see is that there is a significant gradient here by education. So the less education the mother has, the much more likely she is to have her child outside of marriage. But there's been an increase across the board so that among those of the bachelor's degree, 10% of the, the births to women with a four-year degree are outside marriage, which is doubling what it was before. But look at what it is for those with an associate's degree, 43% less, et cetera. Most births to mothers without a four-year college degree are now outside marriage. 40% of all births are outside marriage. This is a dramatic social change that has been made possible by some of the trends that I identified earlier, and all of which are to the good in terms of gender equality. But they do raise real questions as to what fathers are for and what it means to have a model of pro-social masculinity that is compatible with gender equality, which I think we need. And I'll say a bit more. So I'm going to do a bit policy wonky stuff. What do we do? So what? Here are some ideas. Let's start boys in school a year later. They mature later. Chronological age is a pretty you know, crude proxy for developmental age anyway. It differs between boys and girls. Just do it. All, a lot of private schools are doing this already. It's become a bit of a sort of open secret in private schools now that boys get enrolled a bit later um, so that they are that, that much more mature in the school. Um, let's have a lot more technical high schools. Technical high schools are really good for boys. They help some girls too, but the really, really the big evaluations show that they're really good for boys. The US doesn't do much of that. A, a thousand new technical high schools, which maybe would cost us five billion a year, would double the share of students that could go to them, about 15%. As I said, I think that would be good because some of the pedagogy right now in public education is probably a little bit less male friendly um, than it was or could be. So I think technical high school is a good idea along with apprenticeships, et cetera. One, a million more apprenticeships. There's an apprenticeship bill on the floor of the Senate. I've mentioned male teachers already. A massive recruitment drive of male teachers. I would include scholarships, subsidies, et cetera. Just in the same way, we've had scholarships to get women into STEM careers and uh, to do STEM degrees, et cetera, at universities, which is great. Let's have the equivalent to get men into heal professions, into health and education, et cetera, especially in those areas like English where they can have the most effect. I realize that in some circles that's not an un uncontroversial idea. But it seems to me that just to kind of watch the teaching profession gradually lose its men year by year and not do anything about it is irresponsible if we think that men matter in our schools, which we can argue about. Subsidies, I've already mentioned that. And then last, uh, second last, but definitely not least, equal independent paid leave for fathers and mothers. I suggest six months. When I wrote the book, that seemed wildly utopian. Finland's now done it, so it is wildly utopian. 
Uh, Australia's done something similar. But then, only a couple of weeks ago, the US military announced three months paid leave for both. Uh, fathers and mothers, or birth and non-birth parents, because they're not all fathers and mothers, of course, but the majority are. Three months. So suddenly, I don't sound as crazy as I did a little while ago, saying six months. And what do the US military know that the rest of us don't know? Why do, why do, why do dads in the military get three months of paid leave? and not civilians. Um, it seems to me that that's the direction we have to go in, and it's very important that it's available to fathers on an independent basis. Because if fatherhood really does matter, then we need to send that signal through public policy as well. And we also need to improve the rights for uh, unmarried fathers. The divorce system works quite well for separating parents in terms of figuring out custody and money and stuff, but for unmarried parents, it's a mess. In most states, it's very, very difficult. We have to establish paternity. The financial aspect is separate to the care aspect. Um, and it means that a lot of our fathers get benched. So one of the other facts that I tripped across on my way to this book is that within six years of parents separating, a third of children never see their father again. And I think that's unconscionable. And I don't know exactly, and I think it's not just, it's not that these are not, quotes deadbeat dads. We, we're not sending a cultural signal or a policy signal about fathers mattering. And there are different reasons why people might be concerned about that. From the left, there's a concern that it's heteronormative and that we're somehow elevating men above women. I don't think that's true. And from the right, it will be, well, they should get married. But 40% of births are outside marriage already. And so I don't think we can build the future on what I would say are the kind of shifting sands of the marriage contract, given what's happened. I think it has to be built on the idea that dads matter, period, just as mums matter, period, not just as breadwinners. Um, sometimes even, especially when they're not breadwinners. But I'm going to do a bit blatant promotion. Here we go. There's, there's a book. There's a, there's a newsletter. There's a, there's a Twitter feed. There's a podcast. Actually, I've just stopped doing the podcast, so ignore that. Um, but I want to finish with a plea, I think, which is that I mentioned earlier the quote that if we don't, if responsible people don't address real problems and irresponsible people will exploit them. And one of the reasons in the end I stuck with this journey is because if we don't look squarely at the problems that many of our boys and men are facing, acknowledge them, say that they're real, tackle them, be seen to be tackling them. If we don't do that and they're real, we create a vacuum. We create a vacuum in our politics and a vacuum in our society. And just like nature, the internet abhors a vacuum. And so if we don't have a story to tell about how we can help the boys and men in this great, wonderful new world of gender equality, but also one where many of them are struggling, then we're in real trouble. I gave you the suicide numbers. Fiona Shand did some work, which looked at the words that men, including some very young men, had used to describe themselves before taking their lives. And the two most commonly used words to describe themselves were useless and worthless. I don't think it should be controversial to suggest that if we're committed to human flourishing, that means we should look at those boys and men who are struggling without in any way giving up on our other commitments, including those to women and girls. Because if they are struggling, and they're facing a combination of class problems, race problems, mental health problems, education problems, et cetera, and they don't see us taking their problems seriously, they will go find someone who is. You might find them online. And we may not like the people that they find online. But if they find someone online like Andrew Tate, the recently arrested and previously deplatformed British Romanian misogynist, and if you don't know who he is, God bless you, but you don't know what's happening in our society, they will find Andrew Tate. And so if we don't want our boys and our young men to find Andrew Tate or to find equivalent, if we don't want populist politics of whichever flavor to be being fueled by these issues, then we have to deal with it. Problems that are not addressed can metastasize into grievances. Grievances can be exploited. And so we cannot leave this vacuum just because it's uncomfortable for us to have this conversation. And I get the discomfort, I share it. We cannot afford to do that because then we vacate the ground, we create a vacuum, and someone is going to fill it. And so I don't think this is just a policy problem or a political problem or a problem with charts. I think that we're falling down on the job 
um, of helping our boys and men to navigate this new world that we've entered them into, and that has left them vulnerable. So if they end up in those dark spaces of the internet, et cetera, don't blame them, blame us. Because I don't think we're doing a good enough job of telling them a different, better story about what it means to be a man today. Thank you.